Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to get comfortable. You don't necessarily need to take a seat, but if you get, get comfortable, we're a few minutes behind so we can get things going. My name is Steshe Naika. I'm a writing and rhetoric faculty member at ALA, a poet from South Africa, and editor of New Coin, a literary journal based at Rhodes University in Grahamstown. Um, I'm I think it's very affirming seeing everybody here for our stories and for the voices that speak them. So I just want to extend our deep gratitude for choosing to spend your time with us today. I think a fundamental aspect of rewriting African identities and post-colonial projects across the world is telling our own stories. So I'm going to begin by asking our exquisite line of speakers to share a bit of their stories and how this relates to rewriting African identities. You want me to get started because of the gray hair? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when I was growing up uh, in a small university town in Western Nigeria uh, in the early 60s, the idea of identity was fairly localized, right? So, um, you are Yoruba and you are from Mudakeke and that's your world, right? Uh, but over time, this identity becomes very fluid um, and you become so many other things. So I became a newspaper man, then an expired newspaper man, uh, became a father, I dropped out of Christianity and became an atheist. Um, I, so I have all these multiple identities now. So it's very difficult for me to be able to say that uh, the African identity uh, is one thing, because in real life it is not. Right? So I'm a Nigerian at some level, but I actually see myself primarily as an African, uh, and not because Nigeria is a bit dysfunctional. I'm not running away from it completely. <laughs> Uh, but, but, but because that's what it is. So the notion of uh, identity and the stories we tell around these identities must reflect the reality of the world that we live in. So I, I, I see myself in the way of the world. How do I relate to human beings? And the, the conversation that happened in this very room uh, about half an hour ago around the idea of Islam in Africa uh, is in a way for me related to this same subject that we're driving at. How do we resolve the inherent tensions in these multiple identities that we have so that we can get to something that approaches some form of integration, whether within us as individuals or in society writ large? Thank you. Thank you. For me, my relationship with my African heritage was pretty tough on me because I grew up outside the continent. I grew up in, in Paris, France. And this image of Africa uh, shared by the media was, as you can imagine, not very positive. So how can I feel African when the representation of uh, my people were, was something that I could not be proud of? And so, I had to look at my father, uh, a doctor, um, an activist, who was my only role model. I had to find uh, confidence in the books, in the documentaries about um, my own country, Cameroon, to become proud of my roots. And so what I try to do now with uh, my media company and, and the the, the organization that I support is to create new role models, to create this new narrative, to celebrate our heritage and give to the next generation hope. And, and you know, like now I don't talk about me as a Cameroonian mm -hmm. guy. I say I come from Wakanda. <laughs> <laughs> What, what does that mean, Wakanda? Is this new movie. Um, Sorry. Yes. <laughs> 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 All right, I guess I can go. Um, How do you kindly identify yourself? Tell us a little 
maybe you can go ahead. And yeah, so my name is Tanje Bakeng. I'm the founder and CEO of AfroStream, a digital platform uh, distributing African and African American content globally. All right. uh, my name is Priscilla Semperi. I am from Malawi. I'm also an ALA alumna. I graduated. Um, I graduated from ALA in 2013, or actually, as we say at ALA, I joined ALA in 2011, because you never really graduate from ALA. <laughs> um, and I am a student currently. I'm a senior at Smith College, um, which is in Massachusetts. And I'm also a children's book author. I write books for children. Um, and I'm here in many capacities as an alumna, as a children's book author, um, and just as someone who's also very invested in telling stories. Um, so how would I describe myself as it relates to African identity? I think thinking about my Africanness really began at ALA. Um, I think, like you were saying, my identity, my identity was very localized. And I think um, the way that we define ourselves is very relational. We define ourselves based on who we're surrounded with. Um, and then based on what similarities we share with those people or what distinguishes us from the people that we're surrounded with. So in Malawi, it was the tribe I belonged to. It was the city I lived in. It was the school I went to. And then suddenly I came to ALA and there were 30 plus African, identity, uh, African nationalities represented and I became Malawian. And that didn't even carry that much meaning for me as a 16 year old at the time, mm -hmm. besides the fact that that was the passport I held and somehow at cultural exchange, that was the place that I was representing. Um, and then when I left and went for college in the United States, suddenly Africa became the most convenient way of describing myself. Firstly, because if you come from an inconspicuous country like Malawi, <laughs> it follows a lot of questions if you say that you're from Malawi. Besides the fact that Madonna adopted some children from there, people, <laughs> <laughs> people don't usually know much. And so to save myself the, the, you know, the toil of explaining where I come from, saying I'm African um, becomes the most convenient thing to do. And I think that's when my African identity started to be something that I started to think about and engage a lot more. So yeah, that's how I define myself. Uh, all right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Uza Iwala. I, um, if I had known this was going to be a group therapy session, I'm not sure <laughs> I would have been <laughs> um, to come. But I'm a novelist, uh, a filmmaker, and I don't know, sometimes I, I should say probably like a failed doctor. Um, and I also <laughs> run a magazine um, based out of Nigeria called Ventures Africa. Um, it's funny, I actually, um, when it comes to the questions of, of identity and sort of this idea of who you are as an African, um, I think for me the question actually can be answered almost like this. There was, a, there was a time I was in an airport, and this is actually the funniest thing I've ever seen happen, but I was standing in an airport and I, this, this sort of you know, big man in the traditional sort of African sense uh, I think was very irritated about not being able to board his flight. Um, and so he goes up to the person at the counter and he starts shouting. He's like, you know, shouting, shouting, shouting. And he says to the, to the person at the counter, do you know who I am in our <laughs> classic way? And without missing a beat, the woman behind the counter picks up the, the intercom and goes, we have a man at gate six who doesn't know who he is. <laughs> can, you please, can you please come and collect him? <laughs> if you've lost a brother, an uncle, a father, please. Um, and so, I mean, in a sense, I think as a writer, I almost feel like that's kind of what we're doing when you start writing, which is you're, in a sense, asking the world and then asking the world to ask, it, ask itself, do you know who I am? It's a projection, right? It's, and you can be many things depending on who you are relating to. Now, you know, in per terms of personal background, I was born in Washington, D.C., grew up there. And so in a lot of senses, I'm a very American person. My family is extra Nigerian, as I'm sure all of you Nigerians know um, <laughs> what that means. Um, you know, and then there's that identity. And of course, as everyone else has said here, when you come and you sit amidst a room of, um, and I, where's Melani? I think we were just sitting outside and talking about this, watching everyone walking by, you know, feeling very, very African as you see the different dress, as you see, you hear different accents, and you just feel the sense of Africanness that is in and of itself. And 
overwhelming um, sort of all-encompassing identity. And for me as a writer, as a filmmaker, that's what I, like that's what interests me and that's what I write about. And that's sort of why I'm driven to do what I do. Explaining and exploring that. Thank you, thank you everyone. My next question again for everybody is the question of many, an African parent to many a school graduate. Why can't you leave your stories to your grandparents and your griots to tell? <laughs> well, I can, I mean, I can, I can start with that being, um, why don't we leave our, our, uh, talent, our stories to our grandparents? I, I mean, let me put it this way. When I published my first book, so my first book was called Beast of No Nation. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> And that was published in... He's a uh, single, by the way, so... <laughs> <laughs> that that is, explains to my I life just, <laughs> So my, my question first is, is, did you speak to my mom before we came <laughs> <laughs> um, But I, I... So it was published in 2005, right after I finished college. And I, um, I remember taking the book to to uh, give to my grandfather, because you know, here I am, I'm like a published book, finally, like, you know, I, I, I can present it to my grandfather. This is my dad's dad who's no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, and I remember the first thing he, he asked me when I told him I was going to study English in university, he said, English, but don't you already speak it? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, And then, you know, Nigerians have no chill whatsoever. <laughs> um, and then the second thing was, so Beast of No Nation is written in a, in a constructed broken, broken English, I guess, if we want to call it that, almost like taking off a of Kentaro Iwa's Soza Boy, for those of you who know that book. Um, and so I, I give the book to my grandfather. Um, he opens it and reads the first couple of pages, and he says, but I thought you studied English. <laughs> <laughs> um, but which is all to say, I mean, I think the, you know, I think we, we, we often talk about this divide between sort of the older generations and the younger generations in terms of, of storytelling, which I actually don't think exists, if, you're, if I'm honest. I think we can separate that from the sort of, you know, our parents or grandparents wanting us to be professionals, which is one thing. Um, but I think the storytelling thing is very strong. And for me, that's actually where a lot of my desire to write came from. I mean, when I was really young, my father would sit us down and he would tell all kinds of folk tales, which I'm, you know, you are inherently adaptable, you know, transformable, you know, there's so much variation in them. And it's when you see somebody making up story and transferring story to you, they become very invested in story as a form and as a craft and as a thing that you can do. I mean, I think about, you know, my grandfather, the same thing, when we would go to the village to spend summers with them, you know, every evening after sort of evening prayer, you would sit down and you would listen to whether it's stories that he's telling us about his life as a Nigerian growing up in you know, pre-colonial time um, and sort of what that transition was like, the story of how he almost came to the United States of America but didn't for want of 20 pounds. And these things all then form your own understanding of self and self-narrative and then impact the fiction that you write. You know, another example being the stories that you hear about the Nigerian Civil War. Obviously, Chimamanda Adichie, um, big, you know, using that as fodder for a lot of her material. You know, it's, it's stuff that has impacted what I write, and I know that a lot of the younger storytellers are constantly and consistently drawing from what older generations have put out into the world. So the, uh, the imperative to write, to tell a story, is sort of natural in all of us, right? And then to then master the craft and the discipline to actually do the writing. Uh, I found that in my case anyway, derived from the inspiration of environment. So it's another way of expressing what Uza just said, which is that I'm growing up in a particular place at a particular moment. It's a university town. Uh, it's at the, at, the, at the dawn of independence of Nigeria. A lot of idealism. Uh, Wale Shoenka had just left Ibadan to come open the literature department at Ife. I was a few years old, and uh, they have the theater company that uh, tests out all their plays before they go on the road at the local theater. So it may be hard for younger Nigerians to believe this, but we actually used to go to theater on Sunday afternoons. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, and then of course, uh, the newspapers that were, were uh, de delivered to the house, I think three of them in particular, the Daily Times, which was the continent's largest newspaper by far in the 60s, uh, and the Daily Sketch, and I think the Tribune or something like that. And so, my dad would ask me to go pick up the papers from the vendor. So, my curiosity 
uh, about being a newspaper man derived from that and seeing all of these columnists with their pictures in the paper. So mine in the beginning was quite ego driven. I wanted my picture in that <laughs> newspaper. Right? So a combination of a sort of a cultural milieu that nourished your imagination in how you tell stories uh, and uh, the specific circumstance uh, of the time in history in which one uh, was being raised and the community in which one was raised. All of this sparked the desire to sort of create a career out of telling stories about people to other people. Uh, years ago when I was covering uh, Asia for New York Newsday, I remember going to this uh, little village in Vietnam. I had gone to Vietnam specifically to write about the 30th anniversary of the My Lai massacre. I wanted to go and find the villagers and sort of write about what their lives look like now. Uh, and after I'd done that story, I then was told about this village outside Hanoi, where they have about 100 restaurants that all specialized in snake dishes. So I said, that sounds like an interesting story. Because I saw my role then, writing for this New York paper, most of the audience was on Long Island, some in Brooklyn and Queens, these people will never go anywhere in the world. So I was their representative <laughs> there. So I imagined writing the story about this village and the snake dishes as holding these people by the hands and taking them into a Vietnamese uh, village and conducting a sense of what life was like there to them. I find it's the most powerful thing. And the fact that one got paid for this kind of thing was a miracle. Uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, I have never wanted to do anything else. So uh, your grandfather, well, my father will be that generation, right? And my father's sense was that going to University of Lagos to go and study journalism amounted to vagrancy. <laughs> uh, and he didn't speak to me for three years, and I didn't want to do anything else. So we had a standoff, and I did what I had to do. So when I came out of the University of Lagos in 1981, and went to work for the National Concord, which is one of the big papers in Lagos at the time, with uh, MKO Abiola as the publisher. Uh, six days after I joined the paper as a young graduate, I got the big front page story with my byline on the front page of the paper. So finally I arrived, right, with my dream since elementary school. <laughs> so my mother called me and said, you see, your father called his friends to come drink schnapps with him <laughs> when he saw the story. Because apparently it was the first time the family name had ever appeared in print. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was the good lesson. But the, the, but the imperative for storytelling and writing and so on is part of it is just your own ambition, but your ambition is sparked in the first place by the community and the environment in which you were raised. So wait, my question though is what does snake taste like? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a cross between fish and chicken. Oh really? Okay. <laughs> uh, for me, like, uh, I spent so much time talking with my parents, uh, talking about, you know, how they met, how, how it was to grow up in, in, in Cameroon. My father uh, lost his own father when he was seven, my mother, lost her entire family when she was 10. Um, they grew up uh, by themselves. Uh, then they met again uh, in France where when my father was 19 and my mother uh, was about the same age. And so for me, talking with them, talking about their relationship, talking about love, uh, helped me to, to be a better man, helped me to better understand how I behave help me to understand why I'm afraid to, to have my own family, help me to, to, to understand what, is, what it is to be African and, and to create your, your own family. And so the story I try to, to promote and to, to, to share with the rest of the world are not just the big stories about countries, it's stories about our own relationships. It, it's so important and, and, and I realized that my parents were very supportive of you know, my actions in the media industry. When, when they understood that, my goal is to impact your lives. My goal is to help you to question um, your everyday life. Um, my goal is to help you to challenge the statu quo. Um, and I really think that media storytelling mm. can have this type of impact. So with like movies and series, we can have conversations 
that are so difficult to have in our own home. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Um, so I think that, so for me, okay, so I think that the reason why I wouldn't leave storytelling to my grandparents or to my parents is because the way that we tell stories and the way that we listen to stories is changing. And I think the nature of stories is that stories beget stories, right? So um, telling stories leads to more telling of stories. So simply for that fact, growing up listening to stories, I just have that desire to tell stories. But beyond that, with the idea of um, the way that we listen to stories specifically changing, I think that there is so much meaning that stories hold. And I think it's in, it's in discourse today we hear it, that especially for Africans and for African identity, and you know, by extension for many contexts that um, especially grapple with the state of being post-colonial, stories have been a political act and they've been an act of resistance and they've been an act of you know, reclaiming a sense of identity that was lost through the violence of that process. And so, I mean, even, even, I mean, even when we're talking about African identity, that is, that is a construction that we have kind of had to take up and define for ourselves because ad, in the advent of defining what Africa was, that was a process of imperialism and that was not a process of dignifying this space that was named Africa. And so the process of telling stories is kind of appropriating that naming and naming ourselves. Um, and certainly for myself, I think it's a process of doing that. Um, and then I also think that, again, it's, I think storytelling is collaborative. Um, I think that when I tell stories, they hold meaning insofar as the meaning is made by the people who read them. Yeah. And so when I tell the stories, um, I need to do that because the stories are only completely told when they are read. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's honestly just opening up that process, the telling of the stories, opening up that process. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Priscilla. So I want to pick up on something that you've just said, stories mm -hmm. beget stories. What kind of society can you see exist when young black girls pick up a book and rather than seeing characters like Peter Rabbit or Asterix and Obelix, see themselves on the cover and see and hear their Chichewa name? Yeah. <laughs> I think it means everything. And I think, again, this is hardly a new conversation. I think we've heard so many people discuss, um, you know, the fact that, especially a lot of people who grew up reading um, and only had access to books that didn't reflect their realities. Um, if you have heard me talk about this before, this will be the millionth time you've heard me say this, but I always remember a time when I was about 11 and I got an assignment by our English teacher to write a story. And I told this story of two cheerleaders. One was blonde, the other was brunette, and they were you know, part of a cheerleading competition. And this is completely absurd because I grew up in Malawi and <laughs> there was no such thing as cheerleading in Malawi. And <laughs> I picked that up from the stories that I was reading. And so with that idea of stories begetting stories, those are the stories that I knew to tell. And um, so I think it's important in terms of thinking about how stories are reproduced, that if a young black girl sees herself in books, she knows that she can also be in a book and she can also tell a story that has her or someone who looks like her in a book. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also think for non-black kids and for kids that are far removed from contexts like ours, um, that if they pick up a book that, and they can see someone different in it, um, it's super important. So um, currently where I am, I'm in, in Massachusetts, about two hours from Boston, in a place that most people who aren't familiar with Massachusetts or the United States don't know. Uh, and there I, I will do readings in some of the kindergartens and some of this, the, the schools there. And it's usually so profound to see these mostly white kids who have never heard anything about Africa. And if they have, they've only heard bad things about Africa, just light up and, and wonder that this little eight-year-old is talking about things that they never imagined she could talk about. Um, and so just that humanization of our people and our spaces 
and also complicating that and you know so usually I'll, I'll ask kids if they can name any African countries and having them just name even two is always great and then showing them a map and showing them how big the continent is and how many of us exist here is is super important so I think it's important for kids to see themselves but also um, especially kids who belong to you know hegemonic groups or, or hegemonic cultures to see um, kids that don't look like them. Right. So uh, we, we didn't have this problem, uh, people of my generation, MS, Anusi, and so on. Well, because when we were growing up, <laughs> 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 well, Kim is a couple of years ahead, so you know, <laughs> um, uh, because that was not a problem for us. I mean, I, I was uh, acting in, in Twelfth Night. I think I played uh, uh, Malvolio in the Yellow Stockings or something uh, when I was in primary three. Uh, but also I wrote Yoruba poetry, right? And we were reading Achebe and we were reading all of these trials of Brother Jero. We didn't have this problem of not seeing ourselves reflected. It is just sad to me listening to this, and we've had these conversations with our daughters who are sort of your, your age and so on, uh, that we didn't bequeath to you the kind of legacy that was bequeathed to us. Yeah. We had no problem with this identity stuff. Our stories were fully and elegantly and beautifully told. I remember my immediate older brother wrote to me uh, when we were in elementary school. His mission in life was to collect every book in the African Writers Series, which he did. And we all read everything together. We were competing for these things. This was the world in which we grew up. So what happened to us? Television. So huh? but, Television. Wait, but Internet. I, I would actually, I would actually, <laughs> so so we, we, it's actually a matter of reclaiming what was. Not that this didn't exist before. Yeah. So All the books we read was about African people, but it gave us the confidence to also act as Malvolio in Twelfth Night. Right. So, we're, right? we're, so we're, it, we're, it wasn't an issue at all. I would say that is actually don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't self-flagellate too much because I think you know all the books that we read also were about African people as well. I mean, I think I would say that your generation actually did do a pretty good job of handing over a whole set of stories to us. So I, I'm gonna clap for you <laughs> because I don't. He's being I don't, nice to me. Yeah. <laughs> but but I want to go to something that you say um, about sort of acting in Twelfth Night or or representation, which you know, and it might be a slightly off, uh, well, not slightly off view, but something that I believe really firmly. So I think the purpose of telling stories or being exposed to stories. Representation is one thing for sure, right? And you want to make sure, and, and when we talk about power dynamics, and then I'll make another point shortly, like it is important, right, that you have the ability to speak, but I think you also have to be careful at the same time that you don't shut out um, all of the other stuff that's happening around you because the purpose of story, right, is it's relational. It's so that you understand or are exposed to worlds that you wouldn't be exposed to otherwise. So. You know, when you talk, for example, one of my favorite plays is Coriolanus, right? What do I think, why do I really like that play by Shakespeare? It's because I think in so many ways it talks about so, so much of the, like, of what it means to wield power on the continent of Africa. I think you can read that play and really look and you could do that play here with any one of our countries, in any one of our countries and people would automatically understand what you're talking about. They'd be both appalled and like sympathetic to the character of sort of like the dictator figure who is well-meaning in some ways, right? That's a, that's a thing, but like, just because it's Shakespeare doesn't mean that as an African you can't access it, right? At the same time, I think what our problem has been is that people have generally assumed that we don't have stories that are, that are universally... Or well, worthy of telling. Exactly, yes. right? And so I think that's the issue, but for me, I mean, like reading far and wide is, is an, or watching far and wide, which, what, however you consume, I think is an extremely important thing, because if you don't, if you're so siloed in your understanding, then you essentially become just like the people that you complain about, right? Who are people who only read a certain thing. And it's incumbent upon you to know and to expose yourself through literature, through, you know, the, through newspapers, through whatever media it is, so that you understand and can empathize with people as far as you can. And that's what I think we're all supposed to be in the business of doing. Um, number one. Number two, I think, you know, I'm often very interested in this, in sort of like the, the, consideration of the post-colonial at this point in time, because I, I actually don't feel really like any kind of post-colonial person. You know, I know that there's a generation that does, but I think, you know, we've gotten to a point where we do, and a lot of our stories are not necessarily told in opposition to, right, which is what I think the post-colonial is about in a lot of ways. I think our stories are our stories. 
And I think, again, the more that, that they're defined not in opposition to, but just as is, right, the, the richer the experience of either telling or reading or interacting with that story is. And so that's kind of, in, in a sense, my mission is just like, it is a story that exists, right, that is an African story, but it's not an African story in opposition to like a European story of the same sort, you know? So I just want to pick up on that idea of opposition and representation. So in an email I sent to Tonje, quite a, quite a lengthy email mm -hmm. detailing what today would be about <laughs> and his, his brief response, and I'm paraphrasing broadly here, was, thank you, we should talk about Black Panther too. <laughs> 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 so I think I want to talk a little bit about opposition representation. AfroStream has been called in an article on OK Africa, Africa's Netflix. How do we reach a stage where Netflix is called America's Afro stream? So it's really interesting because um, usually I use, I named Afri uh, Afro stream the, the African version of Netflix to raise some money. So it was, it was, it was, easier, <laughs> it was easier to convince investors and that's how I've been able to raise uh, $4 million. But then, uh, we have to build our own identity and unfortunately right now on the <coughs> continent but also within the diaspora, what we celebrate is what is built in the West. Mm -hmm. And once you succeed in the West, then people are supporting you, right? They are saying that, oh, you're one of us, you're, 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 you're we are team Afros, we are team Tanje. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have to build our own success on the continent. For me, it was so difficult to, 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 to grow my business uh, in Africa because, uh, first of all, creating a digital media on the continent is not the most easiest thing to do. Like, access to data is pretty expensive. Um, people don't want uh, to like, pay for content. Uh, they don't realize that um, content is important and expensive. Um, I I also don't think that people understand the impact of the content, how they can be educated through content, they can like uh, be empowered by the content, um, and so um, we had just little support from governments, from telcos, from investors. So in order to succeed, we need to have the support of the African consumers, right? And then once like a digital media company like mine or, or, or yours will become like mainstream in Africa, then Netflix will be called like the, the American stream. version of, <laughs> of yeah, AfroStream. But it's hard because, you know, I was, I was, I was successful uh, in Europe, in the States, but like in Africa, like I struggled. So how, uh, it's an open question, how can we succeed on the continent? The, there is only one answer to that. We have to govern ourselves better. We have some of the most unintelligent political elites to be found anywhere in the world. Uh, we were discussing religion uh, earlier, and we were talking about all these uh, strains of extremism and Boko Haram and the repression of women. People have too much time on their hands. <laughs> so they invest it in all this nonsense uh, and, and wanting to get another, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to feel superior to a girl or not to educate a girl. Uh, we are so badly governed that people flee from the public square to the safety of what they consider their own little tribe. So I think the greatest challenge we have in Africa, it's not that AfroStream couldn't somehow get a technology platform to work and so on. It's because we are not governed properly. And I cannot say this enough to the young people because we are kind of nearing our expiration dates now. Uh, but you cannot build anything that lasts, or you could almost never build anything that lasts, if we are so catastrophically governed. I mean, people are being wasted, literally, like in their tens of millions. So if you want to build AfroStream, the journey doesn't start with your conception of the idea. It starts with whether we've had intelligent telco policies in African countries, whether you know, bandwidth is like uh, uh, a utility 
that is like available, unlimited as the South Koreans do it. There are so many things that we have the capacity to do, but which we are not facing because we have somehow decided that the worst amongst us are the ones who should be in charge of our affairs. Wow. Yeah, so it, it has to start with changing that. Right. So I would even um, extend that more broadly and think, suggest that an unintelligent elite is not a uniquely African <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> Um, it's a little consolation. So, <laughs> <laughs> to, to think about that, if you, um, Dele, you were the first African writer to win the Pulitzer Prize, and similarly, um, there's... She was the first one from New Jersey Shore to win the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> and, and similarly, only one black African writer has won the Nobel Prize. He won it in the year that I was born, which, as you can see from my beard, oh was my many God. moons ago. <laughs> so how do we... You were born in 86. <laughs> what am I doing on this panel? <laughs> <laughs> so how do we, as an African reading public, create measures of merit that challenge the existing measures of merit available? We create ours. I'm working on one now. It's not ready for announcement yet, so I won't say anything. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't believe that we should be complaining and sitting around whining about things. Uh, they don't tell our stories properly. Tell your own bloody stories. Uh, they don't reward our things. Reward yourselves. So we can build these things. And I just want, especially the young people in the room, if there's anything you take away from this room, it has to be that you have the destiny of the continent in your hands. It's not going to come from Beijing or from Paris or from Washington. You have to build it. And we, we should just stop complaining about somebody didn't tell our stories properly or their, their reward. Of course, the reward somebody else gives is according to their own lights. And we shouldn't expect anything else. So if you're getting the Nobel, the Nobel Committee, with its own values, says these are the people we are going to recognize. I think that's perfectly legitimate. Yeah. If you don't like that paradigm, create your own paradigm. Exactly. And don't know yourself. I mean, you're looking at me. I mean, am I supposed to disagree? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's 100%. I think, it, I mean, I'm 100% in agreement. And I think, you know, the, the complication obviously is that we're, you know, there, no one is in any one part of the world specifically anymore. And so I think maybe that's where some of the angst comes from. But it's true, right? The best answer to, to all of this stuff is just doing what you do. Right, and doing it to the best of your ability and having, I mean, whether it's that people, it, just in terms of your story on like people streaming, I remember um, when, uh, when Beasts of No Nation, the film came out, my younger brother sent me an email. He was like, I finally saw the film and it was a picture of him next to like a pirated CD copy. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like thanks brother, thanks. Um, But you know, I mean, it is that thing. It's like you have to, attitude wise, and it's the same thing I think we're saying with stories, is attitude wise, you have to invest in your own existence, right? And I think that is what, you know, in, in essence, what we're talking about. Yeah. So I mean, if there's a if there's a top literature prize for the continent, then you know, let's let's do it, right? If there's a top journalism prize, let's do it. I mean, I think one of the things that we found at Ventures um, was that, you know, you you like it is it is an investment in a person to be able to get someone to to like have the confidence, right, to tell your own story or to tell a story, uh, anyone in particular. And then two, it's, it, it's a process, right? This is not an overnight thing. And I mean, it's the same, it's like with writing, with any sort of story you're telling. It is, you know, we were talking about this yesterday, Karen, right? Like it's an iterative thing, right? So every time you do it, you get better at doing it, you get better at doing it, you get more able to understand what it is you're trying to do. And that takes a lot of time. So I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't sort of like be so hard in the sense that, you know, whether it's the story you tell, the narrative you tell about governance, or the narrative you tell about, you know, politics, or, or even just your own life, love, whatever, that takes time to understand what you are telling and how you can tell it to the best of your ability. And I think we're all doing that. Everyone here is trying to do that in, in his or her own way, and I think we should just keep trying. But I feel like even if we try to tell the best story in the world, uh, we need to educate our children and let them appreciate their own culture. Because right now, I, I feel that this, this trouble, this, this trouble, they, they're so inclined to love what's come from Europe and the States. And when it's African, they're like, mm. I mean, I don't know about, I don't know if Nigerians are like that. No, no Nigerians. Like, <laughs> Nigerians are pretty invested in, but in you know. But educating these children, um, it, it's really important. Yeah, I agree, I agree. I think 
we're definitely cha cha channeling our literary ancestor, Chinua Achebe, who says, if you don't like someone else's story, write your own. Oh. <laughs> um, so in concluding, I would like you to think about a word or two that you would leave for 10-year-olds across the continent. They wouldn't understand mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too far from them. It would be a different world they're living in by the time they need to use it. But yeah, um, uh, courage, confidence. I think. Yeah. I would say that it's okay to be an artist. Don't listen what people say. Be yourself. Yeah. Yeah. What is that thing? <laughs> 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 oh, I see. This is it, it's an African version of okay. tapping. <laughs> <laughs> we live um, and learn. I think I would say um, people are listening. People will listen to you. Um, I'll be the, the, the sappy one. I'll just give you one word. Love. That's it. <laughs> yes. <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fitting way to end. Thank you, everybody, for Thank taking you. the time to Thank be with you. us today. Thank you very much.